on to show you in a minute. I just want to tell you a little bit about what I am and what we do first. So the Fun Palace idea first came up uh, in the late 50s, early 60s um, by a, th a theatre director called Joan Littlewood. Has anyone here heard of Joan Littlewood's work? Oh, what lovely war. Yeah? Things ain't what they used to be. And the architect, Cedric Price. And it was going to be one building to house them all. All the arts, all the sciences, totally accessible to everyone and free to enter. And the main reason Joan wanted to create this building was because her work was done too brilliantly. And she was in the East End of London. And she'd worked here. She, well, basically, she left London when she was 23, having got um, the scholarship to RADA. She's a, a, a working class girl from South East London. South West London, sorry, Stockwell. And um, she got the scholarship to RADA, and they were all posh. And she couldn't stand that they were all posh. And they kept, but she kept winning the speech prizes because she was terribly good at putting on a nice voice. And it was the 30s, and she absolutely hated the kind of theatre she was expected to do when she left drama school, which was, I guess, very early Noel Cow, a bit of Shakespeare, but all of it, very highfalutin, all of it really just for the posh people. And she really believed that theatre could change the world, and this is in the 30s. And um, so what she did was she set out, she had no money at all, to walk from London to Manchester because she believed that Manchester, with the grit off the Pennines and the cold wind, had what she called the fresh wind of communism in the air. But what happened was, after 23 days of walking, she collapsed near Burton-on-Trent. Um, she then went to Manchester. She then came and worked here, and she... she those of you who know your theatre history will know that Ewan McColl uh, was her partner, Jimmy Miller, as, as, as was at the time. So Ewan McColl, uh, the folk artist, the amazing singer, and Joan got together, and they started doing really political theatre, and they were a lot in, in this part of the country, in Manchester and Liverpool. Then they crossed over to the northeast, and they did a great deal of work there, and then she moved back to London. And she hadn't stopped wanting to change the world with her theatre. But what happened when she was at the Theatre Royal Stratford East in the East End of London? was that she started doing brilliantly. And when she was doing brilliantly, her work was transferring to the West End. And when her work transferred to the West End, the poor people didn't go. And the poor people didn't go not just because they couldn't afford it, but because they didn't think those buildings were for them. And I don't believe enough has changed. I don't think the poor people, wherever those poor people are, and it's not just about money, it's about a, a touch of access. It's about a sense of having access. I don't believe that all the people in this country believe they have access to our buildings. I don't believe that all the people in this country have access to the buildings that we all pay a great deal for in our taxpayers' money. And I believe we can change this. So Joan wanted to change it in the 1960s, Joan and Cedric Price, the architect, with this idea of the fun palace, one building to house them all. And the idea was you'd walk in because you'd go to your lecture on mechanics, yeah? Real classic 1960s, working class, young guy, done a day's work, would go to a lecture on mechanics, but as he went, he'd stop and have a, a pint because there'd be a bar there, yeah? The bat, that bit wasn't free, yeah? As he walked beyond that, he'd, he'd hear a woman on his way, she'd be singing an aria. Now, maybe he hadn't heard any opera before in his life, but he'd hear an aria for the first time, and this is crucial. The woman wouldn't just then get a big bouquet of flowers and leave. She'd get off the stage, and she'd ask him if he'd like to sing. The idea is that you break this barrier between the audience and the artist. You break this barrier that's actually been created in this room by you sitting there and me standing here and me having more light on me than you do. This barrier is false and wrong and damaging. It says us and them. It says the people standing here know better than you do. And we think that's bollocks with fun palaces. So what happened was they never got the funding to make the building. Those of you who know a little bit about architecture might know um, of a man called Buckminster Fuller who had all these amazing ideas, American guy. Yehudi Menuhin was on the board. Incredible people were on the board. But it, I've seen the, the minutes that it's from, and I think it was about 1966. The Arts Council wrote back and they said, unfortunately, uh, the Arts Council is interested in something that Miss Littlewood isn't, full stop, art stop. And you know, Joan was interested in arts for the people. And luckily, the Arts Council changed their minds. So fast forward to uh, January 2013. And I'm a novelist. I've published 13 novels and um, over 50 short stories and half a dozen plays. And I'm also a theatre director. And I've been working in theatre and writing for the past 33 years. And it breaks my heart that we still didn't change the world. And the reason I got into the arts is because 
I come from a working class family, born in South London, grew up in a small town in New Zealand. Um, my dad was a New Zealander who came over on Anzac Day, who, I'm telling you, who came over to fight the fascists because he was a good old fashioned socialist and then spent three and a half years in a German prisoner of war camp. Um, but he met my mum after the war, they had seven kids and we moved to New Zealand when I was five. So I got the great privilege of growing up both um, white working class in South East London and then white working class in uh, a timber town in New Zealand that had 70% Maori and Polynesian population. And there were 26 languages in my primary school. And instead of thinking that was bad, people knew that was brilliant. We were multicultural before it was trendy. And it was fantastic being multicultural before it was trendy because I grew up with kids who came from an oral storytelling culture. I grew up with kids who believed that it was okay for them to speak up. And I grew up with kids who spoke in all sorts of different languages and we all thought that was fine and exciting and we all had tons to learn from each other. However, what I didn't grow up with was access to the arts because it was a small town, almost everyone was poor, everyone worked at the mill that my mum and dad worked at. It was a timber mill. Pretty much everyone worked there. The only people who didn't ran the shops that they shopped at. Um, and the closest theatre was three hours drive away and we had a cinema that was open on a Saturday night and we had a library and the library did make all the difference. But if you were me and you wanted to be an actor or maybe a writer because you liked acting and you liked writing but we didn't even do drama at school then, I'm 52, and we didn't do drama in school at all. Um, kind of what, what Nicky Morgan wants us to get back to, right? And if you were me then, you'd have had no access to the arts at all. And what changed my life wasn't a role model, a world-class actor coming to our school. It wasn't a world-class orchestra coming to our school. It was a two-man hamlet came to our school when I was 15 years old. And I was 15 years old in 1978, right? And there was these two guys, they were playing Hamlet and Laertes and all the other characters. One was blonde, one was brunette. It's 78, okay? So looking at some of you, you are around my age, a few of you. Uh, it was Starsky and Hutch time, yeah? And because it was Starsky and Hutch time, I knew that I fancied the brunette one. My girlfriends knew they fancied the blonde one. And as I stood there looking at the brunette one, I thought, oh my God, I know him. He's Pamela Givens' big brother. And I went to school with, I went to primary school with his little sister. And that's what changed my life. What changed my life was somebody like me being an artist. Not somebody on the television. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Not somebody on the television. Not a stranger. Not somebody distant and different who talked with a different accent. But someone like me. So... Two years ago, I, with this now career as an artist, lucky me, two years ago, I was at an event, it's called Devoted and Disgruntled, and they happen all over the country, and they do happen here if you're interested in theatre, and it's for people who are devoted to and disgruntled with theatre. And it's held in open space. And open space is a brilliant meeting format that's used for peace, um, conflict resolution and peace talks. It's used for business. And we also use it for this. And it means that anyone who's got any idea at all can stand up and say, I'd like to talk about this. And if people come to your, your part of the session, brilliant, that's really fantastic. If they don't, either your idea's a bit shit, or maybe your idea is so ahead of the time that no one can even understand how brilliant it is yet. So I called a session which was Joan Littlewood will be, will, would have been 100 on the 6th of October 2014. Would anyone else like to do something for her centenary because she was an amazing left-wing brilliant political theatre maker who wanted to give arts to the people but could we not do a revival because 2014 and 1914 meant there was going to be a lot of oh what a lovely wars anyway. There were over 100. And 16 people came to that meeting, and we talked for about 45 minutes, and we talked about what of Joan's work we loved the idea of, and we said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could make a fun palace? Because the fun palace didn't stop being a brilliant idea. And the fun palace didn't stop being an incredible possibility where you might bring people together, local people, people like me, people like you, to create something in their own space. And we were going, yeah, and who could give us the space, and who could give us a venue, and how would it work? And you know how serendipity is just the most amazing thing? Well, when you work in open space, people are in lots of different sections around the room. And you're encouraged. If you're bored, get up and leave. Go somewhere else. Go to some other section. I mean this now, too. If I'm boring you, please, it's fine. Tweet or go somewhere else or go and get a coffee. Finish it. Really, it's disrespectful to, give our, to, to be somewhere where we're not giving our attention. And open space says this very clearly. So what happened was we were over here, and this man walked by looked down, saw that we'd written 
Fun Palace on a big piece of paper. His name was Mark Curtis and he runs the Theatre Royal Winchester. He looked over and he went, oh yeah, it's our um, 100th anniversary next year. We could do a fun palace, we could just do it for the weekend. And we went, oh my God, that's the idea, that's what we'll do. We'll just tell people they can do it for the weekend. Now, brilliantly, I adore Twitter, so this is how Nick and I got talking. What happened is, when you tweet, and you don't need to have lots and lots of followers, okay? So, like, I do have quite a few followers now, but I certainly didn't when I started, and I only started two years ago. But when you tweet, if you're follow I recommend if you don't like Twitter, it's your fault. It's because you're following the wrong people. Right? It's like watching the Jeremy Kyle show and going, this is terrible, this is terrible, turn it off. It's really okay, you're allowed to choose what you follow, okay? So, I was following all these brilliant people and then I started telling them about this idea for a fun palace and we could do it on the weekend and anyone could do it and it could happen anywhere. And a couple of really fortunate things happened. One is Gemma Bodney from the Liverpool Everyman here tweeted back, I'm in. And you know how brilliant it is when someone says, I'm in, and they've got a following, and they're running a building. And then Erica Wyman, who'd just been announced as the Deputy Artistic Director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, said, I'm in. And then the South Bank Centre said they were in. And that was brilliant because we had the glossy buildings in. And glossy buildings really help, particularly if you're someone like me who's never done anything like this before. But the thing that made it much more exciting was that ordinary people said, started saying, can we make a fun palace? And we had no idea what we were doing, right, okay? I have to tell you, we'd never done anything like this before in our lives. The, the, it was me in, at my kitchen table, literally, for a year. Around all my other stuff, I had two plays to direct and a novel to finish, and I still had to do them because I was being paid for them. Uh, emailing people in the middle of the night saying, would you like to join in? I don't know what it needs to be. But then I got Sarah Jane Rawlings, who's now my co-director with Fun Palaces, to come and do it, and she'd done lots more stuff like this. And that was really helpful, because then I had somebody who, who knew a bit more than I did. And we started working out what it was, and we decided to base it on Joan Littlewood's theory. It needed to be free, local, innovative, transformative, and engaging. And that's it, just five things. People could sign up with just agreeing to do just five things. Free because you can't say it's open and accessible to everybody if you're going to charge them to come. Local because that's the point. This is how we role model for each other. This is how we change each other's lives. It's people like me. It's always that thing about people like me. And also, as an artist, I know for a fact I've done free work loads of times. I've gone off and as a, as a novelist, I've gone and done library events all over the country. I hardly ever do stuff where I live right where I live. Those of you who are teachers, we hardly ever do stuff where we live, in our own neighbourhoods. Making a difference right where you are, I promise you, makes a massive difference. Innovative, just doing something you don't normally do. Transformative, can we change this space? There were fun palaces last year in forests, swimming pools, town halls, town squares, tents, and schools, and libraries, and the Liverpool Everyman. Um, <coughs> uh, transformative, ch change the place and engaging. So actually, my, uh, the woman who ended up doing PR with us was going, yeah, but what happens? What happens if UKIP sign up to make a fun palace? What if the British National Party sign up to make a fun palace? You're saying anyone can do it. And I said, could the British National Party or UKIP say that they would be free and engaging? Could they really welcome anyone there? And if they can't, then they won't do it. And if they can welcome anyone there, they're probably not as UKIP as they think they are. So, anyway, what happened was, very quickly it snowballed and it became what I now do. I pay myself two days a week to do it and I, I say now that I volunteer two days a week to run fun palaces. And then I do all the other work, like the writing, the, the novel that I'm doing at the moment and um, making theatre. I do that at, at night and in the weekends, like I used to when I first started doing this stuff and I was house cleaning for rich people so I could afford to be an artist. So it's not that any of that's changed, it's just gone a full circle. So I'll tell you just about a couple of fun palaces. How am I doing for time? Oh, not bad. Just a couple of specifics. So, for example, yes, the Liverpool Everyman made a fun palace. And one of the reasons for wanting to do that was, they, as you know, they were having all of this rebuilding, reworking. And Nick Bagnall, who's a young producer, um, Nick's not in the room by any chance. No, just, it would have been amazing though, wouldn't it? <laughs> Nick Bagnall, who's a young producer, um, uh, got in touch and said, we'd love to do it. And Gemma had been really supportive and said, you know, how will we do that? And I said, well, what we're suggesting is you just let people know they can join in if they want to. And Nick got 
all of these replies. And there's a beautiful blog. If you Googled permaculture, Liverpool, every man in Liverpool, it would come up. There's this fantastic blog by this woman who said she didn't know the venue, she didn't know if they were going to say yes, but she saw a sign somewhere that Nick had put up saying, would you like to come and do something at Liverpool, every man? And she went, yeah, I'd love to. Could I do it because, art, because of the arts and science interface, right? Could I do a permaculture exhibition? Would that be okay for me to do a permaculture exhibition in your brand new lovely shiny theatre? And they said yes, and now she's linked to a whole lot of other lovely shiny theatres. She's bringing sustainability, really brilliant sustainability work, to all these arts people that she'd never connected with before. So with Fun Palaces, we say, if you can possibly say yes, do it. You never know who you're going to meet, and you never know how brilliant that's going to be. So, the other thing to say about it, so that's what happened here. In Farnham, a, young, a group of medical repatriation workers, so there's eight of them, they work at night time and shift work. Two of them got really excited. Six of them aren't British nationals. Two of them got really excited, the French one and the Portuguese one, about making fun palaces. And they went out on the street and they asked the people of Farnham, what do you think community is? We'd like to create an event for you and for us to do together. And the French woman said the first thing she got was somebody, somebody British, saying to her, mm, you're not even from here and you care about community. And she said, I chose not to get angry and I chose not to cry after six years of living here and I had a conversation with a neighbour that I have never had before and now they want to talk about fun palaces because they see that it's for community too. They chose to do it because they wanted to integrate more. And they and they have had a, they had so many people saying no to them. In the end, the Farnham Museum gave them the keys to the museum for 24 hours. They created their fun palace on 20 quid, and they did it with recycled materials, donated materials, and local shops. At Brockwell Lido, they brought the Brixton community, which still is very much a Black British community as well as an Asian community and some white community, together with the Hearn Hill community, which is dead shishi and gentrified now, and they created their fun palace there. And they expected 5,000 people and 2,000 people came. At the Ark in Stockton, which is in the northeast, and that's a particular part of the northeast that is often spoken about as deprived or disadvantaged. But you know what? This government's been going on about austerity for the past five years, and we don't have an austerity of people. We have the best people, the people who want to create and to make events and to make things happen for their own people. And at the Ark Stockton, they again said, come in, use the space, do what you want with the space. 70% of the people who came had never been in that space before. And that happens because if I come in and I go, wow, I've never been in this space, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing a song on your stage, or I'm going to... Uh, lots of physicists did loads of stuff around um, the physics of uh, theatres, the physics of sound, the physics of how this works. Um, <coughs> or I'm going to get my, my cousin, who's a physicist, to come and explain how the lighting system works in this theatre. They bring in their cousins, they bring in their family, they bring in their friends. People bring their own communities with them. Um, Another place to tell you about, uh, obviously the South Bank had loads of debates and loads of, loads of interesting events like that. In Whitstable, a young woman tweeted me and she said, she's young to me, she's in her 30s. Uh, a young woman tweeted me and she said, um, I've never created an event before, is it all right for me to do it? And on our website we have a toolkit, we have somebody who is a digital expert who can help people both be more brilliant than the brilliant they already are, because she's very brilliant, or if they don't even know how to upload a photo, she can help them do that. Um, we have an access provocateur who can help people with disability access. And this year we're working with a sustainability curator to encourage people to be m b much better around eco and green issues. And I said, yes, of course, and we can support you and we can give you help to do this. And what was fantastic was not only did this young woman go to her first ever council meeting, but she sat through two hours about parking. And then she stood up and she said, we'd like a space, we need a hall, and we'd like some money to pay for workshops that we can do in all the local schools before so that then the kids can come, having created some stuff that we can show on the weekend. And the local council gave them 750 quid because it was a bloody good idea. And we are living in a time where local council budgets have been so cut by central government that local councils are cutting money to arts across the board. But we're saying when we bring arts and sciences together, we create a different kind of work. And as an artist, myself, my big dream, and I say this as somebody whose latest play is about women in science, my big dream is not that we put arts and sciences alongside each other, which is what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, Generally, scientists, sciences people use the arts as a better way of engaging, a better way of telling the story. Yeah, And generally, artists go and write a play or they write a song or they write a book and they speak to a scientist to make sure they've got their science right. 
Basically, we sort of feed in from e to each other a bit later in the process. We're very excited that maybe if people use fun palaces to create from the start, what they might end up doing is they might end up creating something brand new. We might make work we've never made before. So, very aware of the time because I've got a train to catch. That's what we are. Nick's just going to finish up for me by showing our film. Is that all right? Can we do that? I am going to do that. I, okay. I, are you going to rush off if I start playing the film? Uh, you're going to head for the... I, I can give you two extra minutes if you promise me the cab won't go. Well, I need 10 seconds for a group hug in a moment. But <laughs> you, you, you can't just throw a grenade into a room like this and then head for the hills in a taxi. <laughs> Professor Dave, what, what have you got to say just briefly? Okay, uh, absolutely fantastic presentation. I'm just wondering about the level of engagement and yep. how much work is needed. Ah, well, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the Fun Palace in Whitstable, which was massively successful, they only signed up in August. And it, the event, sorry, there's some, there's some details that are in the film, but I'll explain now. So, but in the event, look at this in my notes. I totally haven't looked at them. The event happened um, over a weekend uh, on the 4th and 5th of October, and they only signed up in August. And they did it around other jobs. At Liverpool, every man, obviously somebody had a job to produce it. So it's a, as much work as you need it to be. But what we've discovered... And I have a dream, and it's really exciting that we're in a college here, that actually it's a perfect piece of work for a year, say year 11, no, year 10, don't have small children, so I can't remember the, the numbers anymore, um, you know, second years or year 10s to do over their summer holidays to welcome people back for you know, year 11 or for year 3. It's a really great way of handing over. Joan Littlewood's thing was ask the kids, yeah? But don't ask the kids what would they like to do and then get it for them. Ask the kids what would they like to do, then ask them how are they going to do it. And that's what we've done with local places. And clearly it's what you're talking about too, and it's what you guys have been talking about, clearly. So the other thing to say is we're not saying you're not doing this, yeah? What we are saying is that if we have a campaign for culture, and the British Science Association agrees with us that science is culture as well as arts, if we have a campaign for culture that is ongoing and a weekend of action on one weekend, we get a damn sight more impact together. And we can say to whoever becomes the government after the 7th of May that yes, culture does matter, and yes, it does need your input. It's sort of, even though we had so many volunteers, so 138 fun palaces, 130 of them in Britain, two thirds of them outside of London. So proud of that, because we are London based, is where our little office is, and when I say little, I do mean little. Um, it's been given to us very generously, so it's not looking a gift horse in the mouth. Um, but uh, two-thirds of them outside of, outside of London, and that to me is so massively exciting because it shows that even something with a genesis in London, yeah, with Joan Littlewood as a Londoner, and me now living in London, can spread. And eight of them out, out of the country, and already we've got one signed up in Canada, one signed up in New York, um, one in Switzerland coming, and one in Sweden. I'm looking at a map doing this. Um, so have a look at our website. All the details are going to be on this. I'm going to leave these cards, um, which has also got our stuff. And I'll just, uh, before you show the film, I just want to share with you our manifesto. Because I wouldn't do this if I didn't still want to change the world. And I've been political all my life, and I've had cancer twice, and I know that none of us know how long we've got. And I really want to encourage you. You don't have to make a fun palace, right? I just want to encourage you to go whatever the hell I nearly swore more than, even more than I normally do, whatever the hell you need to do to make a difference, particularly looking at the young people, but I think it's also important that people my age think this too, we can still do it. You are never too old or too young to make a difference, yeah? It has to be the difference, though, that you want to make. I've tried making other differences. They weren't quite my difference. Conversation we've been having earlier, Jane, about the difference this is making, yeah? Find your the difference you need to make, because that's where... That's where people start saying yes. This is our manifesto. We believe in the genius in everyone, in everyone an artist and everyone a scientist, and that arts and sciences can change the world for the better. We believe we can do this together, locally, with radical fun, and that anyone, anywhere can make a fun palace. If you want to get involved, all our details are here. I'll leave them. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Come on, hands together for Stella Duffy, please. Because I'm part of the team that co-created this, I get to hug the presenters. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very, very much. We 
wanted to make things that were free, local, innovative, transformative and engaging. And we have done all five of those to the power of 138. They opened the gates and in they came. They never stopped. Hundreds and hundreds of people I've never ever seen before. We will have the Astronomical Society coming in for a, a talk about uh, the sky. Our choir have baked cakes and we've got a, a fundraiser for the choir from the cakes that they've all made. Uh, rapping, uh, film workshop. People teaching the basics of BSL, uh, which is sign communication language. There was um, a food fight. Everyone they had pop. Made. We've been drawing competitions for children and everyone was just so warm and welcoming. Scientist area and uh, they do all the chemicals and everything and the bones and burners and the acids and all that's quite interesting. The fact that this first time for us seeing this new building has been wonderful. I learned how to make fire with a flint and steel. Did, did you, did you see that? Don't forget the mermaids. Oh, there's lovely mermaids. Of course. We've got Anne's uh, kitchen chemistry area here, and we've got a forensic science area back there, and I've got a science art gallery upstairs. And what people forget about science is it's very similar to art. It's all about asking questions. I'm passionate about the art science interface, so for me, this was such a wonderful opportunity to be able to showcase that the two are, in fact, very, very closely related. I didn't really really know until I walked through the door what to expect. The excitement and the buzz was terrific. You just have to watch the children and hear the level of excitement to know that it's a good, good event. Yeah. <laughs> great to see local businesses and local people just trying to have a bit of fun. There's so much stigma about the town. It's not. There's so much good stuff going on. Oh, oh that's fine. Oh, we were kind of given the option to volunteer. And it's kind of a local creative place. Keep people away from their phones. Like, everyone's just always technology. All ages, small to oldest, and uh, we've had great fun. Every single fun palace I've been to has a real flavour of the people there. It's lovely to see people get people together and come out on a Saturday and explore parts of fun and I've never seen before and meet people I, I don't usually see. You know, getting the audience involved and everything, it was really fun. able to just open the doors and say come in and do whatever you want has been really exciting for us and really freeing. What they have done I think is remind people and provoke communities to think about what's relevant for them. How do children and people develop without culture? Crazy people. Fun. Fun and free. And free. Amazing, fabulous and exciting. Fun, fun, fun. Exciting. Exciting, yeah. And uh, educational. People talking and friends. Playful and imaginative. Fun, family. Exciting. Informative. Fun. Bloody marvellous. Fantastic, fantastic example of community, creativity, connection, funded there by these guys, the Arts Council of England, and also the, um, the Lottery Fund. Thanks, a round of applause. Let's have a round of applause for the Arts Council for funding that. And let's have a round of applause for the Lottery for funding that as well. I'm wasted, aren't I?
Um, it's interesting, actually, the, the, the lottery have got a, a big project coming up this year, the power to change. Um, there's talk of £150 million. Pounds. Two projects like that, like what we're doing, oh gosh, I, I, if one day it could be as half as good as that, I'd be blown away. Um, there's a very special person in the audience, actually, one of our trustees. I'm going to put it completely on the spot now, an amazing lady. I met at a, uh, gosh, on a, at a businessy thing one evening, it was actually about two in the morning in the back of a bar, and, and she was telling me about a project she was working on. And that was a thing called the Big Lunch for the year 2012, where they wanted to get everybody out of their houses to eat their lunch in the street. And a street party kind of idea. I don't know if anybody's ever done a, a big lunch. And, and this lady was a communications director at the National Lottery, and I didn't see her again. I ran a big lunch in my street on the, on the back of meeting her. So Linda Quinn, give us a wave. Linda's one of our designate trustees for Steamco when we, um, when we start up as, um, as a charity. We're looking to raise this as a charity. But hey, if nobody's interested, we're not going to do the paperwork, you know. Uh, it's as simple as that. So looking forward to working with Linda. Linda's got so many ideas, such experience of connecting people, driving these projects, the sort of projects like that. And I would imagine that you were involved with that project with somewhere along the lines, Linda. Guys, I mean, your community, does, do you think you could, um, you could see something like that running in your community, Ali? Does, do um, definitely, yeah, go on. <laughs> um, definitely, I mean, I've been involved with um, school fairs, uh, my primary school, Dovedale School, um, and it's the same concept, and I've seen people, I mean, I'm, I'm like a young adult myself now, and I'm, I'm like in there with the kids, just enjoying myself, and I, I enjoy sports, especially basketball, and me being much taller than them, they always like trying to, you know, have, have fun and play basketball with me, so it's, it's all around the same concept of no matter what age you are, you can always have a contribution and engage with what the work Everyone's, uh, everyone else is doing. Fantastic. Chloe, what about you? Are you prepared to try and make a, a fun palace work in your community in Liverpool one day? I actually think it's a great idea. Um, if, you look at, if you look at our college now, um, I'm, I'm from a lower class background, if you wish to still keep with that kind of tradition. So for me to be able to be subjective to these kind of opportunities is fabulous. I, I can imagine that I'd be here today with the opportunities I've had. And if you look at our college, it's, it's a medium for bringing everyone together. Uh, we've got such diversity, where it may be through race, through sexuality, through gender. I mean, science and technology tend to find, unfortunately, it's predominantly males, but that's changing now. And it's at the heart of our college is what we stand for, in addition to bringing people in from primary school. So getting people inspired from a young age, and I think that's really important. And that's what we're doing now. So in the response, I think we're already doing it. You're sure you're doing a science degree, not a dramatic degree? That's just <laughs> Can we have a round of applause to these two guys? Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Sometimes the schools that we have are still implementing a model of education which is, doesn't exist anymore. Steamco that's all that put together this event is doing fantastic work. It's putting the A back in, which is for the arts. What I want to see for the children in my class and my own kids is that they have an exploratory nature. Powering Art Meets Science events in UK schools, we give them a day of creative thinking and doing activities across the STEAM skills. So our work is looking for ways to break through those inequalities and uh, close the creativity gap. Within everything around us is embedded hundreds of ideas waiting to be found. We've just got to look closer. What changed my life was somebody like me being an artist. It was really, really interesting and I think the children felt really um, quite inspired by it. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.